Hi, take your mind back to 1983, early 1983, and well, what were you doing back then? Well, you were probably watching uh, Return of the Jedi, which had just came out, probably watching War Games, absolutely brilliant, and what sort of computer did you have? Well, you probably were thinking in the business world you had an IBM PC. Because the IBM PC came out in 1981 and it had just been selling like hotcakes for a couple of years, but there were no IBM clones back then. So what did you want? In 1983, well, of course, you know, CPM was like going the way of the dodo and PC-DOS was becoming the operating system of choice and you know, CPM getting long in its legs, the Osborne portable computer and the other CPM uh, computers, you know, it was pretty clear that IBM was probably going to be the future. So what did you want? You wanted an IBM compatible computer and you wanted it portable. Who delivered? Compact delivered. Check it out. It's the Compaq Portable. Uh, Compaq famously founded by three employees from uh, Texas Instruments who decided to leave TI, formed their own computer company, and famously, once again, on the back of a uh, paper napkin, they sketched what their computer would look like for their new business in a pie shop, no less. And a couple of years later, Bingo, in March 1983, they released the Compaq Portable Computer like this. Isn't it brilliant? It is the world's first IBM compatible computer. It was pretty close to being IBM compatible. The amazing thing was is that Compaq realized, well, um, IBM have released everything. You could buy the IBM Technical Reference Manual. You could get all the information. I've got an IBM Technical Reference Manual somewhere, damn it. It's probably down in the bunker after the move. Anyway, could have shown you that. Maybe I'll get it later. But anyway, IBM released all the technical specifications for the IBM PC. So it was pretty trivial to make an IBM PC clone. But the sticking point was that IBM held copyright over the BIOS. So you couldn't just copy the BIOS and make an IBM clone. So what Compaq famously did is they had uh, like a team of engineers not look at the BIOS at all, like work in a clean room and basically, well, a metaphorical uh, clean room, a code clean room and uh, duplicate the functionality of the IBM PC BIOS, and they were the first to do it, and that's what they were betting on big for this company. And it paid off for Compaq, because they made 111 million bucks in their first year, which was like a US business record or something, and they made record business sales the next year, bigger than any other company in American history. For like first year startup sales, it was absolutely incredible. And it all came down to this Compaq portable computer. So what we got here, unfortunately, is not the original. This is the Compact Plus, which came out uh, a couple of years later, but the only difference is this one supposedly had an internal hard drive. But what did you want back then? You wanted IBM compatibility uh, so it could run MS-DOS because in a stroke of genius from Bill Gates, he uh, kept rights to be able to sell uh, PC-DOS as MS-DOS to other manufacturers and IBM went, well, what's the, you know, we don't care if you sell it to someone else, who cares, we're big IBM and, ha, well, the joke was on them once the Compact came out and, of course, everyone went nuts over this thing. It was, you know, cheaper, better than the original IBM PC and it was portable. You could fit this under the airline seat of a plane. Only weighed 12 and a half kilos, don't know what it is in pounds for you yanks, um, multiply by 2.2 roughly. Anyway, oh, let's check it out. The Compaq Portable Computer, the world's first IBM PC compatible clone. And at the same time, IBM released the uh, PC XT, which is basically the original PC, but had like hard drive. It really wasn't uh, that much of improvement, just like the uh, Compaq Plus here. It wasn't really any major changes from the original Compaq uh, portable, just like internal hard drive and stuff. Anyway, this bad boy sold for 3,590 Yankee bucks, had 128K of RAM, expandable to 640K. No one will ever need more than 640K of memory, said Bill Gates. It had a 9-inch green CRT, none of that colour rubbish, uh, even though it had CGA uh, colour graphics adapter in it. Uh, classic um, IBM PC uh, equivalent 8088 running at 4.77 megahertz. So it wasn't particularly faster. It wasn't until years later that Compaq started coming out with their uh, Desk Pro models. Did Compaq actually release a 286 machine before IBM did? Before that, IBM actually led the industry, but it was Compaq who then later in the Desk Pro 
models actually went, well, bugger this, we're not waiting for IBM to release it. We're going to release the Compact Desk Pro and we're going to have, it's going to have the new processor and it's going to be faster and it's going to be better. And uh, they and from that point on, the industry just left IBM in their dust. So anyway, normally we turn on before we take it apart. We have to get on, we have to get on. We have so much time and so little to do. Strike that, reverse it. This way, please. But I am actually keen to power this thing up and see if it still works after all these decades. Maybe, maybe not. Let's find out. And as you can see, it looks like they've uh, kept the exact same keyboard layout of the IBM PC there. And of course, the IBM PC layout uh, changed over the years, but the 10 function keys and the mysterious scroll lock key it's all there, but anyway, dual five, full height, five and a quarter inch floppies, none of that half height rubbish. Um, yeah, there's a floppy missing from this one, and this one here is flapping around in the breeze, so <laughs> yeah, I don't hold out much hope. Not that I'm going to have a five and a quarter inch boot floppy, oh, maybe somewhere in the archives, I don't know. Anyway, let's plug it in. First of all, check it out here. This bad boy was actually portable you can these i don't like these little dicky latches here but anyway you could actually fold this and this was actually the bottom of the case that like this like <laughs> there is no external case for this thing and you pop it up like that and bingo you've got your portable your 12 and a half 13 kilo portable computer like that and around the side we've got our uh, mains input and there you go, there's a serial number for those playing along at home. I don't know uh, the date of this one exactly, but it is a Compact Plus. And then they've just got a couple of feet on the bottom like that that can fold in and out. But basically, you just carried it as a, like, <laughs> the case is the actual carry case. It's great. And this is supposed to be another slot, but bugger if I can get this to, uh, I'll figure it out. All right, let's see if this bad boy still boots or not. Here we go, will the magic smoke escape? Fans going? Whoa, yep. <laughs> Something blue. Well, yep, yep, I can smell it. Damn, hang on. Well, yeah, that was dumb, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> should have done the tear down first and uh, yeah, just replaced all the caps as a matter of course, but yeah, it's not as fun. So anyway, yeah, I'll leave the uh, purifier running for a while and just uh, get all the magic smoke smell out of that. Ugh. So on a replay of that footage, you could see sparks coming out of here. You no doubt saw that, but uh, yeah, where the, it's got to be like the mains power supply most likely, although it could have, could be like a uh, low voltage uh, side thing, um, electros or tag tents. Who knows? Reefer madness, maybe. We've seen that before. Anyway, let's try and start taking this apart. I can't see any obvious screws, so anyway, I guess we'll find some. But as with all IBM compatibles, ta-da! There's our slots. It's our CGA video card, external monitor. So maybe even if the internal uh, monitor doesn't work, uh, we could even a composite output there. Uh, three unpopulated slots, so... Yeah. Oh, it is actually uh, pretty obvious why there's no screws on thi this thing, obviously. These top and bottom panels, you can see those in there, they actually just pop right off. So hopefully this should be like really easy access. Well, at least to, you know, prod the internals, but when you have to get the boards out and stuff, that could be a different, which we will, to obviously uh, replace some caps in this thing. That'll be a different matter. So yeah, you can actually get these off. It's not the easiest uh, thing. These clips are a bit dodgy. Jeez, that's a lot of shielding. No wonder it weighs a lot. It, uh, geez, I have to take all that out. Oh, none of that Phillips rubbish. Oh, flathead all the way with LBJ. And there you have it. Well, this is interesting. Ah, uh, the sparks, I saw them come uh, predominantly out of the uh, drive there. So that would indicate, because there's like um, holes through this metalwork here, as you can see, um, that would indicate that it comes from this board here, but that looks to be the CRT driver board. That's interesting. I mean, you know, obviously the main power supply is over here and that is covered by this huge shield here. So I can't see how like any of the light from here would have got over to here um, and then escaped via the uh, floppy drive. So 
maybe the primary supply over here hasn't failed something on this side or it could have been um maybe something in the drive who knows i don't know you'll notice that the floppy drives here have little rubber baby buggy bumpers um and they're down the bottom of the case down there as well you can see them how they sit on those so little uh, compliant mounts that's nice well this is supposed to be the plus model which is supposed to have a hard drive in it and maybe they did actually replace the um second floppy in here with the hard drives but as you can see that's been removed there's the cga vdu card for those uh playing along at home for you video card aficionados of course this is all made in the usa 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 compact computer corp copyright 82 wow let's try and get it what of what date codes have we got on here okay we've got 11th week 84 there so it's got to be somewhere in the early to mid 84s 8420 got a compact uh, asic there that's uh, manufactured by oki that's interesting so is that some sort of custom gate array and of course your 6845 fanboys go wild it's the classic uh, chip there's the video memory you don't get much it's only cga none of that vga rubbish ah i was always a hercules man yeah, we're dating this one about mid-1984 for the video card. And this connector here is the one that buggers off to the uh, CRT driver, so that'd just be your uh, RGBs and your sync. And of course, in these older computers, you always suspect these little tag tantalums. They're infamous there for going out of focus and also... Uh, exploding in flames but they're obviously looking good but if you do want to restore uh, these machines then yeah you'll be looking at uh, replacing the tag tents and for you floppy aficionados here's the floppy controller with a bit of analogy goodness going on here and it's the uh, printer board as well so we've got our printer output and this buggers off to your floppy drive and well there you go that's it smc and a genuine pin lift bodge thank you very much dang i think these front and rear covers are identical i do like symmetry anyway we have a date code um august 1990 blur ink blot is that a four 1994 i think august 94. well looky what we have here this just fell out of the machine that looks like the burnt part of a tag tent so yeah we're gonna find one somewhere i'm sure I really don't mind this uh, design at all. I was able to access the screws for the floppy drive in there. And once you take the two cards out of here, one of them's a short slot, by the way, but it is dedicated to the floppy controller. So I guess no whackers. This should just slide out. Oh, and power and oh, chassis ground. But ta-da, there is our floppy. Full height job. The belt looks in uh, pretty good, Nick, and you can see the uh, timing chart on the top there. I'd be surprised if this bad boy didn't still work, but uh, we did see a flash. Did it come from in here? Not sure. Have to get the cage off. World storage technology assembled in Hong Kong. Must have come out with a cargo plane full of rubber dog shit. Oh, sorry, that was 1986. You screw up just this much. You'll be flying a cargo plane full of rubber dog shit out of Hong Kong. Yes, sir. Well, as I suspected, it wasn't going to come from the floppy. In fact, I don't see any tag tents there at all. Uh, so, no, it uh, the big flash must have uh, come from the other side of the cage elsewhere in the computer. And just you just saw it come out of the uh, floppy drive. So, yeah, uh, looks in pretty good nick, actually. For the stepper motor aficionados. Made in Japan, all the best stuff's made in Japan, even before 1985. So now I'm actually uh, looking down at the, through the slots here onto this board. Can't see any black marks at all, so maybe the flash came out somewhere else. Um, but anyway, now I'm wondering, well, I'm suspecting that this CRT cage, if I take out a couple of screws here and here, and on the uh, back side, over there, I reckon this whole cage will just lift out, modular. Well, that's a bugger. Take a look in there. I've got a screw there. I can get that one out, but there's another one deep in there. I won't be able to get that one out, so that's annoying. Anyway, x-rays, be careful. 
You'll note the date, July 84. It's just something kind of weird about being able to see your keyboard through the back of the case. Hmm. There is some possibility of lifting this CRT driver board out, I suspect, but yeah, it's not the best design. Anyway, yeah, this cage, it doesn't, like it almost comes out. There you go, it's having a wiggle, 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 yeah, but the screws are down in there. It's, oh, come on. Okay, I think what the deal is, is I've got to get out the switch assembly here. And once I do that, I should be able to get down in, well, I screwdriver through the case, get into that screw, and that one there, and I should be able to get the CRT out. Oh, they've left enough lead length on that. Oh, Potter, look at that. I wonder if Potter is potted. Um, UL listed, thank you very much. Wonder if there's any reefer caps inside that. That, that's welded shut. Oh, come to daddy. Yep, oh, look at that. Oh, no, uh, bloody couple of cables attached, but you can see, yep, it's all modular. Brilliant. Apart from the, well, no, I'm going to derate it from brilliant because of the placement of the screws, but, geez, you know, like, this top one here in this cage, I had to take that out with a pair of bloody pliers. But I'll tell you what, I do like how most of these can just slide out like that and the screws can stay in there because they've got the little key thing in there and I can just access that wire there and that's the one that's going to the CRT I think and check it out I really like this this tube going all the way down to the bottom that actually contains the coily cable for the keyboard I like it so I can't you know it's not just flapping around in the breeze in there it can't get like caught on stuff they've got in you know, a nice metal tube nice attention to detail well it's not going to come out without a fight there's a couple of cables on the bottom of this assembly which are supposed to cut and be accessible from that bottom slot you saw but then they're all cable tied in place down to the sh bottom of the chassis so oh i don't know this is absolutely maddening i'm trying to get this connector out of here and oh i, I did i finally got it i barely fitted Oh, tight as a nun's nasty. Now, this other cable here, right, this would come out if it wasn't for the bloody cable ties here, here, and down the bottom. It disconnects from the bottom, but there's a bloody cable tie down there, and th it goes to the speaker. Who the hell put the speaker in the power supply, inside the power supply chassis? You couldn't whack it on, the, I don't know, the side of the case over here or something? I'd like the back here? Maybe? I don't know why inside the bloody power supply cage and then why cable tie the damn thing down in multiple locations where you can't get the module out? Oh, cut that stupid mongrel and there it is. Ta-da! And we should get access to the entire motherboard now and then, oh yeah, we can see the power supply now. Now we can should be able to inspect that without taking it all out, but yeah, something's blowing somewhere. A cursory glance over this doesn't show up anything there's electrolytic caps on here there's no tag tans but all the electros are in good nick there's a couple way up the back there which you can't see but i can see and they look they look all okay so nothing's gone kaboom on there so it looks like uh, the sparks were much bigger and must have come from the main power supply and once again, a cursory glance from, like, way back here doesn't seem to show up anything. All the main electros look all right. They've got the vents on the top. Nothing happened there. A couple of big tag tents there. But the, uh, actually, I got two tag tent fragments out of this thing. Um, so I, I don't see anything obviously blown on that board. I don't smell anything either. So... I'm still baffled as to where it's coming from. I'm going to have to get that board out. There's no burn marks. There's, I can't smell any residual stuff afterwards. Nothing's obviously blown, but had to be a cap somewhere. And I know everyone wants to see the money shot. Here it is. Here's the main PCB. And uh, yeah, it all looks good. There's no orange tag tants on here. There's, uh, you know, a couple of the yellow jobbies, but uh, they look fine. I got five slots, different space in here. Jeez, that's a bit, oh, it's just. 
Not sure if I can deal with that. Oh, anyway, um, socketed RAM here, another DRAM here. So I, I th believe it's supposed to have 128K uh, base memory, although the uh, Expanded Plus model could have more. I'm not sure. Um, so I'd have to get the part numbers off there. But there, that's either 64K uh, for those two banks or it's 128K, I would guess. Well, we don't have to guess because the camcorder has a zoom function. And of course, they are 64k bits a pop, so, uh, by one bit, that's k bits. So we've got eight of them there, none of that parody rubbish. Um, so, yeah, 64, 128, so this one is populated 256 on the board. That's not too shabby. And that over there, that is going to be our famous compact ROM, so I might actually... Uh, rip that out uh, and uh, read that in and dump it and it'll be, yeah, compact. None of that IBM rubbish or Phoenix who came later and then all the other uh, cloners once uh, compact did it, everyone realized and got away with it uh, legally, then everyone else went, yay, we can do that, no worries. Anyway, just got all regular glue logic on there, nothing fancy, 8237. Uh, we'll just scan across there. Regular glue logic, no worries. Uh, in AMD P8237, that's a DMA controller because you know none of that static RAM rubbish. We've got to uh, figure out the DRAM, and there it is. There it is. It's an AMD 8088. Oh, with a co unpopulated co-processor socket, sacrilege. Anyway, you can upgrade this bad boy to the uh, V20. Oh, yeah. There's the clock up in the top corner there, 14.31818 megahertz. And if you do get your confusers out and uh, divide that by 4.77 megahertz, I'm sure you'll find that comes out to an even multiple. Anyway... Um, yeah, is that a, that must be a small little gate array job, I guess. Um, so, yeah, there's nothing else fancy on here. Oh, no, up to, sorry, there is parity down the bottom. They do have parity. Oh, wow, look at that. Extra bit of DRAM. They got the ninth chip. Didn't see it. Anyway, there's a lot of space for ROMs. Check that out. So, I don't know, did they have an option for DOS in ROM? Maybe? Oh, there's very few computers with DOS in ROM. The Australian Kookaburra. Done a video on that. Might have to link it in. Uh, that's one of the very few that on the market. In fact, it was the first one to have DOS in ROM. And apparently, it's quite hard to do. Ah, oh, there's the culprit. Look at it. <laughs> wow, that's at the snot lawn out of it. Thank you very much. Oh, tantalum. Guess we'll have to crank up the old Tantalum mine out in Western Australia and uh, mine some more, because that one's gonski. Was that it? Was that the entire bang? Hmm, maybe the, real, maybe the main power supply still works. So that makes sense with the uh, location of the flash, because that was, you know, pretty much right behind the uh, floppy drive there. So, yeah, that adds up. So off the bat, apart from a closer inspection, I need to get out to do that, um... The main supply looks like it's okay. I mean, I don't see any uh, reefer madness caps. Maybe inside the field, maybe inside the mains input block in there might contain some reefer caps as a filter, but that's hermetically sealed. We can't do anything about that. If you're going to restore this computer and you know use it um, for you know quite significant purpose, then you would go in and recap this whole thing. Uh, you know, get all get rid of all the tag tents. You know, change the electrodes, everything else. I mean, it's just ancient. All right, let's have another go, shall we? Let's just plug it back in. Minus the CRT, minus the video card, minus the uh, floppy controller with the blowing tag tant, and uh, we'll just see if we get five volts on the rail using the new BM786 available shortly. Anyway, let's plug her in. There's a fan, but I think that's directly mains. That's direct mains. Nothing's going bangski yet. Well, I don't want to put my head right over the... <laughs> Right over the, uh, those electros. <laughs> it's a bit of a worry. Got a lead, didn't see that. I don't really see any major test points on here, which is kind of annoying. Ta-da, 5.085, thank you very much for playing. So that thing should be at least booting, and I assume, it's, I don't know if that's a heartbeat lead or whether or not it's just a, you know, a power-on lead. 
All right, here we go. Uh, composite output to a monitor there. And uh, I'm not sure if you have to like change jumpers on the board or anything to enable composite output. But anyway, let's give it a go. Yeah, that lead on the bottom is still on. You can't see it, but whoa. Whoa, did something? Yep. Yeah, we're getting something. I see static. There's no text. Oh, that's a wah, 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 wah. But as I said, could just be jumpers because I did read somewhere that maybe you might have to set them. There is a service manual in quote marks for the uh, 286 version of this. Not, it doesn't, the diagrams don't seem to match up. Uh, for the, that's the compact uh, portable two it's called. This is the portable one. I guess for want of a better word, this is the original one, even though it's the plus model, but yeah, no, nah, there's something there, but no, nah, no text. Okay, so I thought maybe it's not powering up uh, because it doesn't have the uh, disc controller in it. So I thought I'd uh, plug the disc controller back in after fixing that uh, tantalum cap there. And no, it makes no difference. I get the same sort of cruddy crap on the uh, composite output. I've tried changing a few jumpers on the video card. I'm measuring the uh, 12 volt rail now. So the 12 is, you know, 12 and a half and... Uh, but of course that's, you know, probably neither here nor there for like the pairing the thing up and our 5 volt rails good. So our voltage rails are good, but I'm getting no composite output. I still don't know if that's due to uh, the fact that it's not configured to give composite output. Um, I guess the next step is to test the VGA, uh, the CGA output. Sorry, none of that VGA rubbish. Um, but I don't have like a CGA monitor handy, so can't just plug it in. I'll have to like check for the signals with the scope or something. But, you know, uh, before that, you're probably better off checking like processor clock and activity and stuff like that. So power supply is working. The 5 volt rails there, even the 12 volt rails there. So, you know, in theory, if uh, the logic's good, it should boot up. I think, actually, looking at these two screws here, I think the motherboard actually might pull out in a cage as a modular thing. If that's the case, then I can get in there and give it a good visual once over. So I'm going to do that. Get those. Well, one of them's broken. There we go. There we go. Keyboard cable is in the way. I didn't forget to undo it. I just, it's just in the way. And that's a bit messy. In fact, that's really messy, but it does come out. Ta-da. All right. There's the complete motherboard money shot. Now, I've got some dip switches here. I believe these are like for setting up uh, the floppy drive uh, settings and stuff like that. And there's supposed to be another dip switch in here, but which normally sets up the uh, memory settings and stuff like that. But I've read that uh, recent versions of the BIOS actually uh, just didn't bother reading those. They just auto detected how much RAM is in there. So um, yeah, that's all hunky dory. And well, our supply rails are fine. So why isn't this processor working or the processor could be working could be the video card we just don't know yet so what i think i'll do is i'll just start uh, maybe reseat all the socketed uh chips here and oh we're probably reading the rom as well but yeah i'll just reseat them all and maybe it was just a you know socket problem and as you can see there the pins are well they're a little bit crusty aren't they um <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens with age. Of course, they're nice and shiny where they go into the socket, but geez, yeah, they've, uh, they have not aged well. So I was able to read out this ROM. It turns out it's a 64K uh, bit ROM, even though that my uh, TL866 programmer plus two didn't actually support MOSTEC uh, chips. It didn't matter. It's they're just like same pin out, same everything. So unless you're programming them, if you're just reading them, it's not a problem. Um, so I just uh, set it as a 64 and you can see if you set it to a higher value, if you choose like 512K bit or something, it then just duplicates the information. It just reads at multiple times so uh, by doing that you can just search uh, strings through there and I was able to find yeah copyright compact there it is start and the end uh, of the ROM dump so that's how I was able to tell that it was a 64k uh, bit one so a 27c64 uh, you just choose that anyway the good part about this is that I can now get the power supply outside the case and just troubleshoot this even plug in the cards no worries, so uh, get easy access to probing. Brilliant. So I can just power this up on the bench now. And is our LED on? Yeah, our LED is on. So that looks like just a power LED. I don't think, I'm not sure if it's a heartbeat LED. Built by perfectionist, Telefunken. Zippity-doo-dah. Hmm. All right, clock time. 
It's powered up. Pin 19 of the 8088. Remember that from a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. 4.77 megahertz. Of course it is. So we have the clock. No wackers. I don't see activity anywhere else on this. Getting a clock, but it's almost as if it's like held in reset or something. Well, reset is pin 21. It's active high. Yep, the processor is held reset. So that's why it's not doing anything. So all that static was just seen on the composite monitor. That's just, I don't know, it could be like a free running output or something like this. Like there's probably nothing. No, no, there's absolutely nothing there. It's just picking up noise and crap. So yeah, process has been held in reset. Hmm. Well, that's actually not a bad fault to have. I'd rather have that and be able to trace and solve a reset problem than to have, I don't know, activity on the bus and then it's just still not working. So yeah, that's a, you know, it's a fairly easy one to at least start with. So the next thing I'd do is actually check that reset line to see if it's a logic high or whether or not it's actually shorted high because there could be, who knows, there could be like a tag 10 on there that's like a power on uh, reset high or something. So pin 40 over here, that's our 5 volt rail and pin 21, no, it's a meg. So it's not a short. That doesn't necessarily rule out like some voltage dependent uh, you know, issue or something like that, but really you're clutching at straws there. It's it's not a short on the rail to the 5 volts, so there's obviously some logic driving that, but there could be another, uh, you know, shorted tag 10 somewhere else. Now, we don't have the schematics for this, but if it's anything like the IBM PC, and I have no reason to suspect that it's not, because they released the schematics for the IBM, so no doubt I copied it fairly closely, uh, The and of course the 8088 has a uh, companion chip, the 828284 uh, clock, chip which is where the reset signal usually comes from in an IBM PC design and I know this because I've done a video on it I actually published a, um, a Tandy 1000 which is my original uh, IBM PC that I had and I designed a turbo board for that and I hacked into the chip and that's where it comes from so I've got to find that on here somewhere it's, it's got to be there I'm sure oh geez that wasn't hard 8284 there it is of course it's right next to the crystal because it's the clock timer chip um duh so the reset uh from inside this thing here's the data sheet here it actually comes from there's a like a power good uh not reset pin and it's pin 11 here so uh where pin 11 comes from don't know don't care so we're just going to uh measure pin 11 so i have no doubt that the reset output of this is just the logic drive uh going over to here so there's nothing wrong with that but pin 11 could be like shorted on the input or something so let's go ground and ah 20 ohms that's pretty low uh what about positive rail oh 74 ohms that's they're both really low values let's swap the probes over it's still 20 ohms wow that is really low with probes in both directions like that you know it's actually not an active element part doing that it's not uh, like a like you're not just getting like turning on a diode junction or something like that because if we just swap the probes over that's a little uh trick you can use to see if it's like a genuine hard, hard resistance in quote marks um or whether or not it's just you know you're turning on a logic gate or something some multimeters back in the old days it was actually quite common very few of them have it these days they actually have a low ohms uh a button on them which actually sets uh the resistance uh test maximum on compliance voltage of the resistance range to under like a half a volt i.e it won't turn on any diodes and stuff like that so yeah there's something on pin 11 there so that uh not reset input it's usually like a power good signal here's a uh schematic from the ibm uh, pc and you can see that it's uh labeled power good so um that usually comes from the power supply so the power supply will usually indicate to the processor whether or not hey, like the power is good um a logic output so i think that's what's happening so it's likely that pin 11 there goes all the way back to our power supply over there that'd be my guess 
Now, unfortunately, I can't trace that pin visually because there's no track top or bottom and this is a multi-layer board. So I uh, just have to probe it and see. Well, that didn't take long. I just did that off camera. Um, it, it was the second pin I probed here. There you go, 0.24 ohms. So um, the second pin over on the uh, power supply. So, yep, but there. There's just the power supply charging up. So it does actually go, oh, no, 20 ohms. There you go. That's interesting but it is a direct ohmski short yes that is a real term ohmski or at least i'm owning it there you go like 0.21 ohms okay from uh pin 11 of the 8284 to the power supply over here so it looks like the power supply is actually indicating that there's a fault so that there could be i don't know i haven't measured all the rails it could be like the minus five volt rail or something's dead and well it just stops the rest of it powering up which is a bit of a bummer but you know that's what happens in a properly designed system i think i'd rather have a bodge so it like well at least partially works anyway this video is over 30 minutes long and well i'm gonna have to get the bloody power supply out of this thing by the looks of it and yeah that's a lot more work so i might leave that to a, a part two but anyway this was it wasn't supposed to be a repair video it was just supposed to be a uh tear down and look at the world's first ibm compatible PC and not only that it was portable the compact portable absolutely fantastic and it, it catapulted uh, compact to absolute corporate uh, stardom the fastest rising startup business in US history I don't know who eventually beat them I'm sure somebody did but geez anyway they went from naught to hundreds of millions of dollars um, in their first year uh, you know that's like real revenue not bullshit valuation you get these days on startups <laughs> So anyway, if you liked the video, please give it a big a thumbs up. As always, discuss down below and over on the EV blog forum and check out all my alternative channels. And I will, I'm thinking about, let me know in the comments down below, thinking about possibly doing, uh, you know, the occasional exclusive video for my um, Odyssey uh, channel. Like if I repair this one, I could do uh, like a repair video. Whack it on Odyssey. Let me know what you think about that. Anyway, catch you next time. Thank <laughs> you.